Welcome uh, back everyone to the um, Western Hemisphere Virtual Symplectic Seminar. Uh, we're very happy to have Shira Tani from uh, Tel Aviv University uh, kicking off the semester uh, and talking about the Poisson bracket invariant elementary and hard approaches. Um, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> So I'm going to sort of try and discuss three projects today, and they're all related to uh, a conjecture by Poltorovich. This conjecture concerns the Poisson bracket of partitions of unity. So naturally, I'm going to start with some background, which includes uh, stating this conjecture. Uh, then the first project, which is joint with Lev Bukhovsky and Alexander Loganov, is basically a proof of this conjecture in dimension two. Now, one piece of the proof is a problem of, say, functional analytic flavor. And so the second project, which is joint with Yefim Gluskin, is an application of Grath and Dix theorem from functional analysis to this problem. Now, in higher dimensions, both Ravitch conjecture is still open, and all current advances towards it rely on fluoromology. So the third project, which is joint with Yaniv Gnor, is motivated uh, by the approach in higher dimensions and concerns pluromology of Hamiltonians supported on subsets. Also, uh, I will try to explain everything I sort of mention and use, but if anything is unclear or if there are any questions, please uh, interrupt me. Okay, so our story basically begins in uh, 2006 when Entov and Poltorovich discovered a surprising relation between the notion of Poisson bracket and displaceability of subsets of symplectic manifolds. So let me remind you that the Poisson bracket of a pair of Hamiltonians measures the change of one Hamiltonian under the flow of the other. So formally, you define the Poisson bracket of f and g by composing f on the flow of g and then taking the derivative with respect to the time. And equivalently, this is just uh, the symplectic form omega applied to the symplectic gradients of f and g. A subset of a symplectic manifold is called displaceable if there exists a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism that displaces it, or if there exists a Hamiltonian whose time one flow map uh, displaces the set. So the image after time one does not intersect the original set. So having these two notions, we can uh, state the, the theorem by Antov and Poltorovich. So they consider a closed symplectic manifold, an open cover of this manifold, and a subordinate partition of unity. So by that, I mean just the collection of functions that sum up to the constant function one and are supported in the sets of the cover. So the support of Fi is contained in Ui. What they prove is that if the sets are all displaceable, then these functions cannot be all Poisson commuting. So for at least one pair, the Poisson bracket of this pair will be non-vanishing. So for example, here in this picture, uh, you see the two sphere being the, the closed symplectic manifold and open cover by disks. Each one of these disks is displaceable by a rotation of the sphere. And the claim is that any partition of, of unity you take, which is subordinate to this cover, so any collection of functions sum up to one and are supported in single sets from the cover, uh, there would be at least one pair of functions with non-zero Poisson brackets. Okay. So, follow, so uh, ah, one thing that I wanna mention is that the assumptions on the sets being displaceable is completely crucial here. So if you remove this assumption, uh, the assertion is not true. So for example, you can consider a cover of the two sphere by these strips then the central strip contains the, the equator and is non-displaceable. And it's quite easy to find a subordinate partition of unity for which the Poisson brackets will be all zero. So you simply take your functions to depend only on the height, z. And then uh, each function is preserved under the flow of any other function. So following this result, Poltorovich defined an invariant which measures the Poisson bracket of such partitions of unity. So this invariant can be defined in the following way. We start with the Poisson bracket of weight, weighted sums of functions from the partition. So here I think of xi and yj as weights. Then we take the C0 norm of this function, so we maximize over the symplectic manifold. 
and then we maximize over all possible weights. This gives us uh, an, a non-negative number for each collection of functions. Then to get an invariant uh, of, the, of the cover, sorry, we can simply uh, take the infimum over uh, all subordinate partitions of unity. Right, so I take the infimum over all collections of functions uh, that sum up to one and are supported in single sets from the cover. Right. Now the motivation for this definition comes from operational quantum mechanics in which this Poisson bracket invariant represents a certain noise. Um, now this, this formula for the Poisson bracket invariant is not very important to, to process, but I do want you to notice that um, this infimum here on the space of, of collection of functions makes this invariant quite difficult to compute or to estimate. So especially in cases where the answer is not zero, uh, this is hard to estimate. Poltrovich also conjectured a lower bound for this invariant. So the conjecture states that there exists a constant depending only on the symplectic manifold. And the emphasis here is that constant does not depend on the cover such that the product of the Poisson bracket invariant and the maximal displacement energy of a set from the cover is bounded from below by this constant. So this inequality is interpreted as an uncertainty, uncertainty principle. So when the cover consists of very small sets, it's very localized, then we, we claim or we conjecture that the Poisson bracket invariant, which represents a certain noise, should be very large. Now this conjecture is in general still open and there has been several works that made advances towards it. Um, most of these works rely on fluoromology and I will say more about this approach later on. Together with Bukhovsky and Loganov, we proved this conjecture in dimension two. So basically we show that uh, on a surface endowed with an area form, there exists a universal constant for which this inequality holds. Now the proof in dimension two does not use any uh, floor theoretic or J-holomorphic tools. So, so the tools are completely elementary. Uh, I'm not gonna give a proper outline of the proof, but maybe I'll say a few, a few sentences just to give you a taste of what kind of arguments uh, arise. So the proof starts with the observation that in dimension two, estimating uh, the Poisson bracket of a pair of functions can be translated into counting intersections of their level sets. So what we actually do is we try to count intersections of level sets of, function, of the functions forming the partitions of unity. Now, in order to produce enough intersections, we consider all orderings of functions from the partition. And for each ordering, we construct a graph out of the level sets, which divides the surface into sufficiently fine pieces. Then we use a combinatorial argument to, uh, to estimate the total number of intersections of any two such graphs. So in short, the proof is a combination of uh, geometric and combinatorial arguments. And the fact that and the, the two-dimensionality basically helps you replace dynamics by geometry. Okay. Now, another piece of the proof is a lemma which enables us to replace this uh, Poisson bracket invariant by a, slim, a slightly simpler invariant. And this lemma holds in general dimension. So let me state it. So the claim is that there exists a constant depending only on the dimension of the symplectic manifold, such that for every, every collection of functions, uh, the Poisson bracket invariant as defined by Poltorovich can be bounded by the sum of absolute values of the Poisson brackets up to this constant C of n. So this basically enables, us, en enables you to get rid of the weighted sums and maximizing over the weights that appeared in the original definition. Now the upper bound here is trivial, it's just triangle inequality. So the non-trivial part is the lower bound. Originally we had this constant uh, C of n growing exponentially in the dimension. And it turns out that you can use uh, Groth and Dick's theorem to improve this to a sharp dependence of square root of n. So Groth and Dick's theorem is a fundamental result from functional analysis. I'm gonna state it in the next slide, but before I do that, let me convince you that this lemma, this inequality, can be reduced to a, a question which looks related to functional analysis. And so it makes sense to look for tools in functional analysis. 
So going back to this inequality, this is an inequality between C0 norms of functions. So here I didn't write it, but it's a C0 norm of, of the function. And in the Poisson bracket invariant, there was a C0 norm in the definition. So we're comparing to C0 norms of functions. It's definitely sufficient to prove the inequality holds pointwise. So here I wrote the pointwise version of this inequality where I replaced uh, the Poisson bracket of fi and fj at a certain point by omega applied to their symplectic gradients at this point. So here I think of vi as the symplectic gradient of fi at a fixed point p. But naturally it's, it's enough to prove this inequality now for a general collection of vectors. The next step is to consider a matrix whose entries are omega applied to vi and vj. Then the latter inequality becomes this one. So on the left-hand side, you simply get uh, the sum of absolute values of, on, of the entries. And on the right-hand side, it's a simple exercise to see that what you're getting is the norm of A as an operator between the L infinity and the L1 spaces. So you can sort of see that uh, this maximum over the weights is a maximum over the unit ball in the L infinity norm. Okay. And I think that this already looks related to functional analysis. And in the next slide, when I state growth index theorem, you will see the right-hand side appearing. And then the work is basically to relate the left-hand side to the other data you get from the theorem. Okay. So here it is. And um, I'm stating, that, like a quick disclaimer, I'm not stating the original formulation due to growth index, but an equivalent uh, statement from a paper by PZO or rather a special case of the equivalent statement. Okay, so the claim is very simple. Suppose we have an M by N matrix A. We think of it as an operator between the L infinity and the L1 spaces of the corresponding dimensions. The claim is that there exists another matrix B of which we think as an operator between the corresponding Hilbert spaces and vectors lambda and mu with non-negative entries and Euclidean norms bounded by one, such that A factors through B via the diagonal matrices corresponding to lambda and mu, and the norm of B as an operator between the Hilbert spaces is bounded by a constant times the norm of A as an operator between the L infinity and the L1 spaces. So essentially, this theorem says that linear operators between the L infinity and the L1 spaces can be factored through operators between the corresponding Hilbert spaces, and that this factorization is done without increasing the norm. So like this is the important part, that you do not increase the norm uh, in this factorization up to this constant kg. And this constant is a universal constant. It does not depend on anything. Um, it's sometimes referred to as Groth and Nix constant. Its exact value is unknown, but there are upper bounds and it's not big. It's like less than three. We also found another uh, application of this theorem to say a question in linear symplectic algebra, but I'm not gonna state it because it sort of trails away from the main story here. Maybe I should stop for questions. Are there any questions? Is there a picture that's associated to this theorem? Something about maybe like squares and diamonds and maybe ellipsoids? Ah, you mean, I understand what you mean. I'm trying to visualize what this means I'm having. I mean, I, I think I see something, but I don't, I can't. Well, anyway, it's okay. If it's not some stand, I'm just wondering whether there's some kind of picture that people in the know draw when they discuss this theorem. But if it's not the case, then that's fine. We can just move on. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think so, but maybe it's, maybe you can find a picture for this, spe like, specific special case. I see, I see, because of course you're um, saying the theorem is more general. The theorem is much more general, yes, and, and so there I, I doubt that you will have a simple picture. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, how universal is K sub G? Does, does it at least depend on M and N? No, that's the beauty of it. I see. It does not depend on it. It's like, it's less, you can write three there. It's just not gonna be sharp. Thank you. Yeah, so 
So actually in, in using this theorem and this application, it was very important for us that the, the constant kg will not depend on the dimensions here. Because uh, if I go if I go to the back to the sorry to the previous slide, um, then the dimensions of of these spaces are the number of of sets in the cover, and we don't want our constant to depend on the cover. So so it's a like a crucial point. Okay. So uh, sorry, one one quick question. Yeah. Would you mind just quickly going back to PB of F, the definition of that? I just sort of uh, yeah, sure. Trying to understand the uh, lemma that you stated can... previously. Yes. Ah. there it is. Okay, Wait, thanks. Just a moment. Got it. It's the maximum over the unit ball, right? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me go back. Uh. Okay, sorry. Okay, so now I wanna go back to, to the conjecture itself and uh, talk about what's happening in higher dimensions. So I already said that it's open, but there are there is a method to produce lower bounds for the Poisson bracket invariant. Uh, these lower bounds are not as good as the conjecture lower bound. Uh, yes, but you can still sort of say something. So these lower bounds for the Poisson bracket invariant are uh, expressed in terms of Schwartz capacities, which are certain sizes of subsets of closed symplectic manifolds. These sizes are defined through spectral invariants, which are constructed out of fluoromology. So I'm gonna sort of say a few words about each block in this diagram. So fluoromology, as most of you know, is a version of morsomology applied to the action functional, which is defined on the space of contractible loops in M. As such, the associated chain complex is generated by the critical points of the action functional, <laughs> um, which correspond to one periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian flow. And the differential is defined by counting negative gradient flow lines, uh, which correspond to certain cylinders uh, connecting two periodic orbits, which, uh, yeah, solve floor equations. So really like the simplest version of this theory. And the uh, associated homology is uh, independent of the Hamiltonian and the almost complex structure that I didn't mention here and is isomorphic to the say singular homology of the manifold. So out of this construction, you can extract numerical invariants of the function of the Hamiltonian F. And these are called spectral invariants. So here is uh, an improper, but I think intuitive definition. So suppose we have uh, a class in the homology of M. We can identify it with a class in the floor homology of F. The spectral invariant of F with respect to this class is basically the smallest action of a representative of this class in the floor chain complex. So this is like the smallest action threshold you need in order to see the class alpha if you consider only periodic orbits of action up to this threshold. So let me illustrate it on an example, and uh, naturally the example will be in Morse homology. So here we have the perfect Morse, Morse function on the torus. And if we take alpha to be the class of a point, it is uniquely represented by the minimum point of F. And so the spectral invariant, so the value in which we see this class is just going to be the minimal value of F. Uh, the class of this non-contractible loop here is uniquely represented by the saddle point X. And so the value in which we can see it is f at x. And the class of the whole manifold is represented by the maximum. So the value is going to be the maximal value of f. OK. Now we can use these uh, numerical invariants to define uh, a relative size or a relative capacity of u in m. The reason I'm saying relative is that this size depends on the embedding of u into m. So it's not an intrinsic invariant of u. So the size of U and M or the Schwartz capacity of U and M can be defined in the following way. We consider all Hamiltonians whose flow is supported in the set U. And then we, we take the supremum over the difference between the spectral invariants of F with respect to the fundamental and the point class. The reason to look at this difference is that um, the, the spectral invariant with respect to the fundamental class is known to be the largest one among all classes. And that of the point class is known to be the smallest one among all classes. So this is really like the size of the action gap 
that contains all of the spectral invariants of f, uh, you know, over all classes. So you can think of it as the spectral size of f. So in short, the Schwartz capacity is just uh, the largest spectral size of a Hamiltonian whose flow is supported in the domain or in the set. Now, these capacities can be bounded in terms of the displacement energy of U and M, and this can be done by the energy capacity inequality. So this is a famous inequality stating that this, the spectral invariant with respect to any class is bounded by the displacement energy of the support of the flow. And so an immediate application is that Schwartz capacity is bounded by twice the displacement energy. Okay, any questions? Right, but how does this story relate to uh, the Poisson bracket invariant? So Antov Poltarovich and Sapolsky found lower bounds for the Poisson bracket invariant in terms of these Schwartz capacities of the sets. So now you might be thinking, okay, so we know that Schwartz capacities are bounded in terms of the displacement energies. The conjecture was asking for lower bounds in terms of the displacement energy. Why doesn't this conclude the story? So the problem here is that these lower bounds decay with the number of sets in the cover. So for covers by many, many sets, you get a very small lower bound that really trails away from, from the conjecture lower bound. So then Polterovich had a nice idea of how to try to cope with this, uh, with this problem. So he said, uh, let's look at disjoint sets from the cover and think of them as a single disconnected set. So now I want to replace these two orange disks by the disconnected set, which is their disjoint union. This naturally, trivially reduces the number of sets in the cover. But then when I apply Antofoltrovitz and Sapolsky, I end up with the Schwartz capacity of the disjoint union. And now I might not be able to use the energy capacity inequality because even though each one of these disks is displaceable on its own, it might happen that the disjoint union is not displaceable. So this approach basically uh, motivated the study of spectral invariants of these jointly supported Hamiltonians. And most of the works that I mentioned earlier uh, in the context of finding lower bounds for the Poisson bracket invariant actually do that. So what they actually do is they study spectral invariants of these jointly supported Hamiltonians. They get uh, upper bounds for the Schwartz capacity of the disjoint unions. And then using Polterovich approach, you just get a, a lower bound for the Poisson bracket invariant. Now, let me state uh, the most recent one of these just to give you a, a, a look of how, how these results look like, right? So this is a theorem by Humilier, Leroy, and Sifadini, and it's sometimes as the max formula for spectral invariance. So what they show is that if you have two Hamiltonians supported in disjoint domains satisfying certain conditions on a symplectically a spherical manifold, then the spectral invariant of their sum with respect to the fundamental class is equal to the maximum over the invariance of the summit. Now using this claim, this claim is very good in terms of uh, finding lower bounds for the Poisson bracket invariant because using this claim, you can simply bound the Schwartz capacity of the disjoint union in terms of the maximal, maximal capacity of a single set from the union. And then you can apply the, the energy capacity inequality and get uh, a nice lower bound. Um, so, so this is like a very nice thing, but the assumption here is that the manifold is, is a spherical and this is a crucial assumption. So this statement is not true. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say what incompressible is, is. I will say it afterwards because, okay, I'll say it afterwards, but in like, yeah, I'll just say it in a moment, like three slides or something. <laughs> Um, so here, so here, just think of some nice domains in aspherical manifolds. So I was saying that this uh, claim is not true in non-aspherical manifolds, and I will say more about it really in the end. Okay. So sort of in, in light of these results and trying to take a broader perspective, we thought it would be interesting to uh, study the floor complex and the differential of disjointly supported Hamiltonians in the hope of deriving new understandings of spectral invariants of such uh, disjointly supported Hamiltonians. 
Or even more generally, you can just say, I have a closed symplectic manifold. I have a Hamiltonian supported on a subset. I want to study the floor complex and the differential of such Hamiltonians in the hope of understanding floor theoretic invariance better. So this is the topic of the third uh, project that I want to discuss, which is joint with Yaniv Ganor. So I'm going to repeat the question because this is sort of, I think, of independent interest uh, of what I said so far. So our, our context now is that we have a closed symplectic manifold and we have a Hamiltonian supported on a subset. This subset might be connected or might be disconnected. And then we can think of it as two different Hamiltonians supported on two different sets. And then we want to understand the floor complex and the differential in the hope of deriving applications for floor theoretic invariance, such as the spectral invariance that I defined. Okay, so I'm gonna start by uh, stating the setting in which we work. So from now on, I'm gonna assume omega is closed symplectically a spherical. By that, I mean that uh, omega and the first term class vanish on pi two of m. And I will say more uh, later on about this assumption, why, why is it, it is crucial. And I'm gonna assume that the Hamiltonians are supported in disjoint embeddings of nice star-shaped domains in R2n into m. You can actually do more general than that. So it's enough to assume that the, the domains have a contact type incompressible boundaries. So sorry for, but incompressible means that the map induced on the fundamental groups by the inclusion of the boundary into M is injective. Or in other words, if you have a loop on the boundary that is contractible in the manifold, it has to be contractible within the boundary, okay? And we call these domains CAB domains. But if you don't wanna process it, you can simply think of nice starship domains embedded into a, a symplectically a spherical manifold. So here is an illustration of what's okay for us and what's not okay for us. So anything on the sphere is not good. And this embedding of the annulus into the torus is not incompressible. So the boundary is contractible in the torus, but not contractible in the boundary or in the domain. This would be even enough, but okay. So under these assumptions, we have a construction of what we call a barricade, which basically prevents floor trajectories from going in and out of the domain. Such Construction naturally gives you information on the floor differential, which is defined by counting these trajectories. This construction has uh, several applications to floor theoretic invariance. So I'm gonna start by stating the application, sort of in the hope of convincing you that the construction is interesting, and then I'll talk about the construction itself. Okay, so starting with the applications, the first one is basically saying that uh, in this setting, so for such Hamiltonians, on such manifolds, uh, the spectral invariants with respect to the fundamental class are independent of the ambient manifold. So let me explain this on a picture and then I'll make a formal point. So suppose we have uh, an admissible domain V embedded into two symplectic, uh, symplectically aspherical manifolds. If we have a Hamiltonian supported in the, in, in the interior of this domain, we can push it to Hamiltonians on the closed manifold simply using the embeddings and extending by zero. So now we have two symplectic manifolds, two Hamiltonians. We can compute their spectral invariance with respect to the fundamental classes here and there. The claim is that you get the same thing. So in this sense, the spectral invariant does not see the topology of M outside the, manif outside the, the domain containing the support. The statement is not trivial because these invariants are constructed out of floor homology, which is a global invariant of the manifold. Okay, so here is a formal claim. So we have two symplectically aspherical manifolds. We have a domain with a contact type boundary, which when embedded into these manifolds uh, satisfy our conditions. And for every Hamiltonian supported in it, the crucial invariance with respect to the fundamental classes coincide. Can I ask a very simple question? Maybe you mentioned this already, but yeah. to, to define floor homology, do you just take some small perturbation to make everything non-degenerate outside yeah. of this? Okay. Yes, so um, so actually spectral invariants are, are continuous. And so they're defined for degenerate Hamiltonians as well. That's why I'm sort of skipping this issue. But to analyze yes. the, the complex and the differential, of course I need a non-degenerate perturbation. Yeah. 
Um, an important remark about this sort of locality phenomena of spectral invariance is that it does not hold if we remove the assumption on the manifold being a spherical or this maybe weird incompressibility condition on the boundary. Uh, the counterexamples are quite simple and they are hinted by the pictures I had under the not okay for us label in the previous slide. So it seems that in some sense, uh, such sort of locality or separation phenomena are really different in the presence of spheres or on a spherical manifolds. Okay. What about, do you, do you know uh, if you relax the contact type boundary assumption, do, do you have counterexamples? No, we're not sure about this yeah, issue. Sure. I see, so it's, it could be that you could remove that, but it's not, not clear yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I would guess that maybe like, you know, a, a slight relax relaxation, like, I don't know, stable Hamiltonian structure or stuff like this, this would be doable maybe. But if you have like no, no structure to work with, then I'm not sure what, what will happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, the rest of the applications uh, I wanna state concern uh, comparing floor theoretic invariants of these jointly supported Hamiltonians with those of their sum. So these are more in the flavor or of, of the max formula I showed you earlier by Familia Lerone Fadini. So you can think of such results as, in some sense, measuring communication between these jointly supported Hamiltonians. So how much they affect each other. How does the sum behave uh, with respect, like, uh, versus the, the each each separate Hamiltonian. Okay, so the first claim is basically an extension of Humiliel Lorenzi Fadini's max formula to a general homology class. So I remind you that they showed that if alpha here is the fundamental class, that you have then you have equality. So the invariant of the sum is equal to the maximum. Equality does not hold for a general homology class. So for example, the Poincaré duality property for spectral invariance will imply that the class of a point satisfies a min formula. So the invariant of the sum is equal to the minimum over the invariance of the summons. But an inequality does hold for a general homology class. Uh, the second application concerns the boundary depth of Hamiltonians. If you're not familiar with that, the boundary depth is basically the largest action gap between a boundary term in the Flora chain complex and its smallest primitive. So you can think of it as the size of the differential map in terms of action filtration. Or if you're familiar with the language of barcodes in fluoromology, then this would be the length of the longest finite bar. So the claim is that the, bar, that the boundary depth of a sum of disjointly supported Hamiltonians is always greater or equal than the boundary depth of each summoned. So morally, this basically means that you cannot reduce the boundary depth by adding dynamics somewhere else in the manifold. You can only increase it, sort of. The third and the last application concerns a new action selector defined by a bonadolo Haugenschlein. Um, the cool thing about this action selector is that its construction does not use flow homology. So it uses uh, solutions to flow equation. It uses Gromov compactness, but it does not use um, the transversality or the gluing or a lot of the hard analysis that goes into properly constructing fluoromology. So in some sense, this is an action selector with a shorter uh, path towards it. Um, I gave here an approximation of uh, the definition for this uh, action selector, but I don't wanna get into it. So I'll just say that it's defined uh, via some minimax procedure on homotopies of Hamiltonians whose left end is the Hamiltonian in question. So you have a Hamiltonian F, you consider all homotopies starting at F ending somewhere, and then you do a minimax procedure for uh, solutions of the S-dependent floor equation corresponding to these homotopies, okay? Now in their paper, they ask uh, whether this new action selector coincides with the spectral invariant of the point class. And as a first step, they ask whether it satisfies a min formula, like the one proved by Humiliel Lorenzi Fadini for the point class. This question about whether it satisfies a min formula is motivated by another result of Humiliel Lorenzi Fadini. So they showed that on surfaces, and we're 
all in a spherical category now, so other than the sphere. And for autonomous Hamiltonians, every action selector satisfying this mean formula here uh, will coincide with the spectral invariant of the point class. So if you manage to show uh, this equality for this new action selector, then you know that at least on surfaces and for autonomous Hamiltonian, this is the same as the spectral invariant of the point. So, so far our construction were enable, was ena uh, enable us to prove an inequality. Okay. So as I already mentioned, sort of the main ingredient in the proofs of all of these claims uh, is a construction which prevents floor trajectories from entering and exiting the domain containing the support of the Hamiltonian. This construction is motivated by a very simple picture in Morse homology. So I'm gonna start with that. So now we're doing Morse homology. We have a Riemannian manifold and we have a smooth function supported on a subset of this manifold. We want to perturb it into a Morse function in such a way that we will have some sort of a separation between what's happening in the domain and what's happening outside of the domain. And by separation, I mean in terms of the Morse complex and the differential. Now it's not difficult to arrange for the critical points to lie either inside or outside, right? So the main question is about the differential, which is defined by counting negative gradient flow lines. So the natural thing to do would be to create a, a small bump around a neighborhood of the boundary. So this bump sort of, uh, I mean, goes all the way around the boundary. If you have this bump, then negative gradient flow lines that start at a critical point in the interior part of the domain, so away from the boundary, not on the bump, are completely trapped in this interior region. So they cannot climb on the bump, right? Similarly, negative gradient flow lines that end in the domain can either start from an interior critical point or from a critical point on the bump, but they're still contained in the domain. They cannot start outside. So we have some restrictions on where do negative gradient flow lines go and they cannot really cross this bump, cross the neighborhood of the boundary. But we don't have a complete separation here between what's happening inside and outside. So for example, negative gradient flow lines that start on critical points on the bump can flow both in and out. But this is expected because we know that the Morse differential cannot split into a direct sum of what's happening inside the domain and what's happening outside the domain. Otherwise the homology would split into a direct sum and then this would contradict the fact that we're supposed to end up with the homology of the manifold. So if this looks a bit like mayer vieteris for more homology, then this makes sense because it's sort of related to the idea there. Okay, so our construction is basically an adaptation of this picture to a uh, floor homology. So here is the claim. Suppose you have a Hamiltonian supported in a, an admissible domain for us on a symplectically a spherical manifold. The claim is that there exists a perturbation of this Hamiltonian and an almost complex structure such that for every solution of the corresponding floor equation, so for every negative gradient flow line of the corresponding action functional, uh, the restrictions we had in the Morse case hold in this case as well. So if we start in the domain and away from the boundary, we're completely trapped in this region. And if we end up in the domain that we're contained, then we cont we're contained in the domain. So here is an illustration of the allowed and forbidden trajectories for such a pair. Um, as far as terminology goes uh, for a pair of Hamiltonian, an almost complex structure for which these uh, restrictions hold, we say that this pair has a barricade around the boundary. So the barricade is the analog of this bump. Okay. Um, this theorem also holds for homotopies of Hamiltonians. Uh, and then the solutions are naturally with respect to the S-dependent floor equation. So having these restrictions on floor trajectories, one can derive information on the floor differential. As in the Morse case, the differential is not going to split into a direct sum of what's happening inside and what's happening outside. But if you look at the correct decomposition of the floor complex, the differential takes a triangular block form. So here is the decomposition that you need to consider. So the first term here, is generated by possibly non-constant one periodic orbits that lie in the interior part of the domain. So this is 
the, the part of the manifold that contains the support of the original Hamiltonian. And then the second component is generated by critical points outside. And the third is generated by critical points on this bump. So here we have this uh, sort of analog of this bump. So under this decomposition, uh, the differential takes the following triangular block form. And I should say here that when I write, uh, for example, differential restricted to V, I mean that this map is defined by counting only trajectories that are completely contained in V. So this map does not see and does not care what happens outside of the domain V. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so now I want to say uh, a few words about how to construct these barricades and hopefully explain uh, where things break in the presence of spheres. Okay, so I'm going to sort of switch to board mode now. Okay, so constructing these uh, barricades. So the picture we, we have is the following. We have this uh, domain. This is the boundary of the domain. And we have this neighborhood of the boundary. And everything is in a symplectically a spherical manifold M. So here we have a neighborhood of the boundary inside the domain V. What we're going to do is uh, actually sort of construct uh, a bump here. But this bump is going to be taken. So this is a bump. Uh, which is with respect to the radial uh, coordinate arising from the contact structure of the boundary. So we, we assume that the boundary has a contact type structure. We have a radial coordinate in the neighborhood of the boundary and we can construct such a bound. So now we have some sort of dynamics happening, happening inside. We don't know how the flow looks. And outside, we have something that is almost constant, right? And, and here we have this bump. We need to rule out uh, the existence of a bunch of floor trajectories. So I'm going to illustrate it on, for example, an entering trajectory. So suppose we have a floor trajectory going inside, so ending at some uh, one periodic orbit inside the domain. And starting outside, so the starting point is going to be a critical point since the Hamiltonian approximates zero outside. So my cylinder looks like, uh, like this. So this is U and going inwards. So we want to rule out the existence of such U. The way to do it is to look at the loop that is obtained as the intersection of this cylinder with the boundary of the domain. So here gamma is the intersection of the cylinder with the boundary of V. The main claim is that you can estimate the action of this loop. So you can show, you can bound the action of this loop away from zero. So you can show that the action of this loop gamma is strictly larger than some positive epsilon. And if you choose your parameters correctly, you choose the approximation correctly, you can arrange for the actions of the generators outside of the domain to be smaller than this epsilon. So this would be smaller than the action of x minus. So the action of x minus is just going to be the Hamiltonian at x minus because it's just a critical point, right? And now this already contradicts the fact that uh, action should be decreasing along floor solutions. So this is in contradiction to the fact that the action should be decreasing along negative gradient flow lines of the action functional, which are solutions of floor equation. OK. So I'm not going to say how to compute, how to estimate the action of, of this loop. But here we can already see uh, something that breaks when we add spheres to our manifolds, right? So if, if the manifold weren't a spherical, the generators of the, the floor chain complex outside 
would be pairs of critical points and spheres. And then the actions of these generators could be arbitrarily large, right? So, so now the action of x minus and v, this would be like f of x minus minus the area of v. This could be very, very large. And we don't have this contradiction here. Now, this, this problem is not just an artifact of the method because this barricade construction, so having these restrictions on floor trajectory is enough to prove the applications that I mentioned, which are simply not true in the presence of spheres. So it seems that this phenomena of uh, sort of stuff not, communica not communicating with each other or like that you can separate between uh, or you can you can make the differential take a nice triangular form. This fact uh, is is really sort of an aspherical phenomena. Okay. Any questions? So now I want to say um, a few words about uh, what happens when we do have spheres. So. Um, Remember, I stated this uh, max formula by Emilia Lorenzo Fadini, right? So they they were saying that uh, the spectral invariant of a sum of these jointly supported Hamiltonians with respect to the fundamental class is equal to the maximum over the invariance of the summons. So the invariant of f and the invariant of g. And I told you that. Uh, this, this claim is, does not hold on, on the sphere. So, um, sorry, on, in the presence of spheres. So what Humiliel, Lorenzo, Fadini, uh, so they, they showed it and they basically constructed um, an example. So they constructed an example on S2 of two Hamiltonians, F and G, for which you have here a strict inequality in this direction. So the invariant of the sum is strictly smaller than the maximum over the invariance of the summons. So their example is basically um, a careful construction of radial um, Hamiltonians. So you have a Hamiltonian F supported in the upper hemisphere here, and you have a Hamiltonian G supported in the lower hemisphere here. And they're both radial, so they depend only on the height. And you can sort of, choose these radial functions very, very carefully and analyze the action spectrum to make this inequality uh, hold. And, uh, and this example is, or the fact that this, this max formula holds in a very narrow setting, so it does not hold on any, any non-aspherical manifold, um, can look in a first glance somewhat unfortunate from the perspective of the Poisson bracket invariant. So I told you that this max formula was a very nice tool to produce lower bounds for this Poisson bracket invariant. So, so, but then on a, on a second glance, this is really not, not such a bad news. So the reason is that from the perspective of the Poisson bracket invariant, or alternatively, if what you're interested in is, um, upper bounds for Schwartz capacities, Schwartz capacities of this joint unions of sets, then what you really need is upper bounds for the left-hand side here. And so from that perspective, having an inequality in this direction is just as good as equality. Okay, so then the natural question that arises is maybe an inequality holds in a wider setting. So the question is perhaps uh, the spectral invariant of the sum is less than or equal than the maximum in a wider setting. So this is basically the topic of a uh, current work of mine. And the answer is, 
and this is uh, still in progress. That uh, in many in, in various situations, then yes, you can produce this inequality. So by various situations, I mean under under uh, certain conditions on the manifold. and the domains containing the supports. So by conditions on the manifold, I mean naturally allowing manifolds with spheres. So things like monotone and rational manifolds. Um, so in particular, you can show that in this picture uh, of the example by Umiliello and Cifadini, you cannot change the Hamiltonians to make, uh, to produce a, a, an opposite inequality. Now, the, the methods to prove such an inequality, um, a max inequality, say, are completely different or very different from uh, those I mentioned earlier. So this barricade construction really cannot be made to work, not as it is uh, in the presence of spheres. So the tools here uh, are, so the main tool is a very nice construction due to Seifadini. Which is called uh, spectral killers. And you also need to do some analysis of the Reb dynamics on the boundaries of the domains containing the supports. So these are containing the supports. Okay. So so you can sort of make this in, this inequality hold in, in various settings, and then using all of the sort of known machinery, you can produce lower bounds for this uh, Poisson bracket invariant. Um, so I think I'm, I want to end with saying uh, what I don't know about this question. So what I don't know is whether there exists a counterexample for this inequality. So whether there exists a closed symplectic manifold M omega and Hamiltonians, disjointly supported Hamiltonians. F and G such that the spectral invariant of the sum with respect to the fundamental class is uh, strictly larger than the maximum over the invariance of the summons. Right. So I think that this is all I wanted to say. So. Great, let's, uh, let's give uh, Shiri a round of, Shira a round of applause. Are there any questions for the speaker? Um, can I ask about your, um, at the very end you said under some conditions can you say something about what that, what kind of conditions are we talking about? So I think that my uh, the battery of my laptop just died. <laughs> at a perfect timing with the end of my talk. But I don't see anyone.
Uh, my, yeah. only my, my only question was that in your last slide, or rather the slide before the uh, illustration, um, you said that under some conditions, you can uh, prove this even in the non-aspherical case. Can, yeah. can you say something about what those conditions might be? Yeah. Um, so it depends. So the conditions on the domains depend on the condition on the on the manifold. So not surprisingly, the 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 less you assume on the manifold, the more you need to assume about the domain. Um, so for example, for rational manifolds, you can do this for small enough balls. Um, so if, if you like assume not much about the manifold, then you need nice domains, balls, which are small enough. Um, if you consider, if you allow for monotone manifolds, then in some sense, negatively monotone manifolds behave so like they're, they're more similar to a spherical manifold uh, than, than positive ones. So you need to assume less. So uh, on negatively monotone manifolds is enough to assume that your domains are dynamically convex. For example, this would do. You can do slightly less than that, um, actually. And for positively monotone manifolds, um, you need to add to this dynamical convexity condition uh, some, some limitation on the, um, on the size of the domains. So not to allow too big of domains that are too big, um, which is not very surprising because from the point of view of spectral invariance in positive monotone manifolds, um, spectral invariants behave very differently in large and small uh, domains. So for example, the Schwartz capacities of uh, say large balls in positively monotone manifolds would be infinite, right? So if you take a large disk on the sphere that contains the equator, the spectral invariants are unbounded, for example. Does this answer the question? Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to know. I do believe that it should be possible to produce this on some non-rational manifolds as well, but I, I don't have a, a proof yet. But it wouldn't be surprising, I think, um, if you if you allow for you know enough restrictions on the domains. Yes, I understand. Any more questions? Let's see. You, you have a question in, in the chat. Oh, oh gosh. I didn't see it. Let's see. Um, thank you, Daniel. <laughs> um, you mentioned how in today's answer, the Bessemer bracket can be approximated by intersection of level six. Um, No. So the, for the first question, I, maybe I should read the question. So the question is, uh, in two dimensions, uh, the Poisson bracket of a pair of functions can be estimated via intersections of uh, intersections of the, the level sets of the functions. And the question is, can we, we do we, something? We, oh, no. Just a moment. Shira, unmute yourself on the other computer because now we can't hear you. So mute oh, yourself on the iPad or this your, your tablet. This was so complicated. Okay. <laughs> sorry. You're good now. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, the question was, we had, I, I said that, um, uh, let me maybe go back. So I said that in two dimensions, you can uh, estimate the Poisson bracket of a pair of functions just by counting intersections of their level sets. And the question is, uh, can we do something similar for uh, four dimensions and then maybe count something else, but geometric? So can we translate dynamics to geometry in, in four dimensions? Is this the question? Am I, did I get it right? Okay, so the answer is no. And the reason is uh, sort of goes through why can we do this in two dimensions? So in two dimensions, level sets of the functions are one dimensional. And the flow is, well, the function is preserved by the flow. So the flow has to go inside this one dimensional set. 
So this means that you know where the flow goes just by knowing the geometry of the level set. So it's the, the dynamics is very, very restricted. In higher dimensions, you already have, so the dimensions of the level sets and the, and the flow does not, do not match. And so you don't know where exactly in the level set the flow goes. Um, and there were other questions. Let me sort of go back to the chat. Uh, no, but I can't do that while. So can, can someone resend the questions from the chat because they got erased in the shutdown of my computer? Right, and regarding the barricade theorem, do you know if there is uh, an analog, analogous open string result? I have no idea, right? I don't know enough about, no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know enough about anything. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know of, uh, I, I actually don't know about an analogous result in any context. Um, I can say that, Compute like it's not related to the question. So um, I'm actually, I don't know how to answer the question. So I'm going to say something else. Uh, but maybe it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, the, the computation for like, so the computations needed to construct the barricade. So for example, the estimate of this intersection loop and, and other things, uh, they are, some of them are quite similar to computations that appear in uh, papers on uh, symplectic homology. So for example, similar computations were made by, so I should have mentioned it maybe, um, uh, by Silibak and Wancha in their paper about, uh, about symplectic homologies. And uh, also I think by Abu Zaid and Zaidel even before that, right? So, but, but these were like mainly sort of um, maximum principle style computations, so. So they, they, it covers some of the restrictions you want for your trajectories, but not, not all of them. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? Sorry for the mess with the laptop dying in the end. <laughs> Are there any uh, further questions for the speaker? Let's see. Um, uh, well, if, if not, let's thank uh, Shira again for the great talk. Thank you. So I will stop the recording now and uh,